Last Tuesday was October the 31st, and it marked the fi 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, which began October 31st, 1517. The Reformation began when an, uh, an Augustinian monk by the name of Martin Luther nailed 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, Germany. His proposition sparked a debate that eventually gave us five key Reformation doctrines. Uh, they're listed there. We're going to be looking at them for the next uh, few weeks as we go through the month of December. They are sola scriptura, sola gratia, sola fide, solus Christus, and soli dio gloria. The word sola stands for our English word alone. Each of these statements are essential to our faith. They are closely related and build upon one another. Deviation from one leads to denial of the other. Do you remember this? The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. Remember that growing up in Sunday school? Some of us are still growing, um, and that's a good thing. Well, Luther's concern regarding Scripture was that it should be the soul, ultimate authority of the church, for the church, and for us as Christian men and women. Sola Scriptura has power. We just sang about that power in the person of Jesus Christ, who, according to Scripture, is the living Word of God. Not the traditions of any church, not the insights of any particular leader. As Martin said, a simple layman armed with Scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. Indeed, in speaking about the Reformation that he initiated, Luther said, I did nothing, but the Word of God did everything. And that's how Reformation begins. It begins when we are a people who are into the Word of God, reading it, meditating upon it, remembering it, and speaking it to those we come in, uh, we cross paths with through our day to day walks and affairs of life. So for over 500 years, the evangelical church has agreed that the scripture was the sole ultimate authority for the church. A passage of scripture speaks to it. It's a, our very first doctrine in the Salvation Army speaks to it. Paul speaks to it in his writings here in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses uh, 15, 6 to 17. But what I want us to concentrate on this morning with regards to sola scriptura is, is this. What about its sufficiency? What about its sufficiency? Do we today believe that God has given us everything we need for faith and life in this book. Do we believe that? Or do we suppose that we have to supplement the scripture with other things to make our ministry effective? And we don't have to look very far to see in our society today that others look elsewhere, believing that other things need to be added to it. Well, we firmly believe that Scripture alone is our foundation. We proclaim that our salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. And for the next four weeks, we're going to look at that. Scripture alone, sola scriptura, God's word, from a distance. How many have heard that? song from a distance it's written by bet midler it's a beautiful song it reminds us through the course of life 
that from a distance God is watching us. But it's interesting, it's reassuring to know that God is doing that. His word uh, reminds us that God is doing that. But here's the thing. We don't need to look for God in bizarre, faraway places. We don't need to climb the mountains or cross the distant seas to find God. Where is God found? Well, growing up in Sunday school, we were taught that God is found in this book, in Scripture. We only need to open its pages. And we see, and we see scripture, uh, description after description of God, both God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And all that that association brings to you and I in our walk as Christian men and women. We know in Scripture alone we see portraits of our Heavenly Father. Scripture is God's very word. Carol reminded of us of that when she quoted uh, John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. The word was with God. Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, our text this morning, that all Scripture is God-breathed. We believe that, right? While Paul, Luke, and Moses put the pen to the paper, it was God who delivered the message. God inspired the prophets and the apostles to write the very words he wanted. Scripture, therefore, is God's voice. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 47, Moses told the people that they were to obey God's word and teach it to their children. Listen to what it says. For it is no empty word for you, but your very life. Your very life. And then in Matthew chapter 4, quoting this verse, uh, Matthew supports it by saying, Men shall not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Martin Luther once wrote, Let the man who would hear God speak read Holy Scripture. Let the man who would hear God speak read Holy Scripture. Are you looking for God this morning? Do you wish to be close to Him? Look no further than this book. You will always find him there. Luther went on to say, My conscience is captive to the living word of God. My conscience is captive to the living word of God. What a different world it would be if all of us Christian men and women lived and were able to say that. Our minds are captive, our conscience are captive to the Word of God. And yet Paul's key ministry was nothing other than the Word of God. He said to Timothy, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I used to have this in my, uh, this saying as, as my closing comments or salutation on my uh, business cards and in my email. It says this, read the Bible to be wise, believe the Bible to be safe, practice the Bible to be holy. It's a nice little acronym, a uh, nice little uh, message there that kind of sums up the significance, at least for me, the significance of sola scriptura. The sacred writings, God's word, the scripture contains everything we need God to tell us 
for faith and life. Scripture reveals, secondly, Christ to us. All of Scripture points to Jesus. The opening words in Revelation chapter 1 says, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ that came to the Apostle John. The Old Testament promised that Jesus would come. The New Testament shows the promise fulfilled. In a few weeks, we're going to be out there on the street corners, in the, in the storefronts, and we're going to be uh, maybe ringing a bell, but we're going to be standing on a kettle, and we're going to be showing and proclaiming in some way or another uh, what we are about, the Salvation Army, as we solicit funds to get us, to, to carry us through this next year uh, in helping the less fortunate in our communities. And as a result of that, we're going to be showing to them, in some way or another, whether it's in conversation, how the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. All one has to carry with them is the carol sheet of the Salvation Army. On the back cover is a list of prophecies of old and the New Testament fulfillments through Jesus Christ. They are interrelated. One completes the other. The promise that God gives us in Scripture is the promise of forgiveness and eternal life purchased through the blood of Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us step by step how Christ saved us. It tells us that Christ is God and that he became man. It tells us Christ lived a perfect life on our behalf. It tells us Christ gave his life as a payment for the dirt we carry, our sin. Jesus himself said in John chapter 5, verse 39, these are the scriptures that testify about me. Testimony is what is given in trial. Scripture is God's own testimony that in the great trial known as judgment, we will be declared not guilty because of Jesus Christ. Scripture is God's word. Scripture reveals Christ to us. The third thing Scripture does is it saves us. And I had to re really think about that. Scripture saves us. Uh, and, I, and I really thought about it for a, for a while to get my head around it. You see, God could zap faith into us if he wanted to do that. God could create faith while we're sleeping or eating or playing a round of golf. But God has chosen to work through Scripture. Through the gospel message, the Holy Spirit creates and strengthens saving faith in Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2, Paul reminds us, by this gospel, you are saved. I struggled with that fact until I was reminded of John 1 and 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. The Word was with God. And we know if we read further in John's Gospel that Jesus Christ is the living Word of God. And we know from Scripture that Jesus Christ came from his lofty estate, took on our likeness, so that he could renew the relationship we had with God our Father through salvation. You see, Scripture is where God speaks to us, it's where God tells us all about a loving Savior. It is the means by which God brings salvation to us. In James chapter 1, verse 21, we are told, So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your 
souls. Next week, when we look at another one of the solas, we're going to see exactly how sola gratia is played out from this particular verse. What do we need in order to have eternal life? Martin Luther would say, Scripture alone, sola scriptura. This is such a beautiful truth. A simple children's song tells us, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And then there's the other childhood chorus, how do I know? The Bible tells me so. Jesus, or Scripture, the Word of God that reveals Christ to us, who brings salvation and assists us in evangelism. In our day, we have a proliferation of seeker-driven churches, don't we? Used to be really strong a few years back. These are churches that present the gospel to non-Christians in order to convert them to Christ. It's not a bad thing. Goal is good. Their services are professionally choreographed, choreographed with concert-like music, colorful stage lighting, moving testimonies, and emotional appeals. However, the only way the Holy Spirit works to regenerate sinners is by the Word of God. As Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, you have been born again not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. Let's look at Jesus' ministry for a moment to see how, it's, how this plays out. Jesus is, is introduced to us in the Gospel of Mark this way. Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. Mark introduces Jesus as a preacher. And Jesus' message is the good news of the gospel. The good news is, about how sinners could become part of the kingdom of God. If someone said, how do you enter the kingdom of God? The answer was that a person must repent of sin, believe the good news that Jesus saves sinners. Now, as one continues to read through Mark's gospel, we see that Jesus went into a synagogue one day on the Sabbath and began to teach there. And Mark says that Jesus, in in chapter 1, verse 21, 22, and 27, Jesus was teaching how the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority. And how they were all amazed and asked, What is this? A new teaching with authority? Well, friends, we should be getting Mark's point. Jesus came as a preacher, and he was preaching the word of God, which is the good news of salvation. According to Jesus, the preeminent ministry, his preeminent ministry was to proclaim the good news. He did. In John chapter 3, Jesus has an encounter with a, a woman, a particular woman at the well in Samaria. And this is what happened as a result of the conversation recorded in John chapter 3. Sorry, John chapter 4. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that remarkable? We no longer believe it goes on to say later on, we no longer believe just because of what you said, the villagers said to the Samaritan woman. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. Friends, throughout, throughout scripture and indeed throughout history, God has repeatedly shown that his word 
is indeed sufficient for evangelism. God's Scripture is God's word. Scripture reveals Christ. Scripture saves us. Scripture e helps us to evangelize. And lastly, Scripture brings cultural transformation. Have you noticed how things are in our world today? A number of years back, I can remember as a young person going to school. Matter of fact, it was Mary Street School. And I can remember the very first period that we had in school was religious instruction uh, because my core officer came and taught it. Now we can't even pray in school. We can't even post a Christmas tree in school. We can't even, we can't even put up a manger scene in school. That's just how our world is changing. At the end of the year, I'm going to be performing that wonderful uh, privilege of uh, uniting a couple in marriage. And uh, it is, as Scripture says, man and woman. But now we have same-sex marriages. Now we encounter things like struggling over whether people have the right to wear that burpa, cover their face. We struggle with Sharia law. It's being talked about. So, where does that leave you and I as Christian men and women? How do we impact society? How do we impact the culture? What do we do to see culture transformed? Do we set up political action committees like some have? Do we promote social justice teams, rightly so, as we struggle to become more aware of uh, the sex trade and, and the, the, the abuse and the harm that, that it brings society as a whole? I would like to suggest that we impact our culture by teaching and practicing the Word of God. Why? Because God's Word is sufficient for cultural transformation. If it can change me and it can change you, it can, can change society because we're the ones who make up society. In 1535, the Council of 200, which governed the city of Geneva, Switzerland, decided to break with Catholicism and align the city with the Protestant Reformation. They had no idea what that meant. Up to this point, the city had been notorious for its riots, gambling, indecent dancing, drunkenness, adultery, and other vices. They thought becoming Protestant would solve the problem. However, we all know that genuine moral change never comes from the top down by law, but from the bottom up through transformed people. Geneva's morals continued to decline. So what did they do? The council did one thing right. They invited John Calvin to become Geneva's chief pastor and preacher. He arrived in August of 1536, a year after the change. He was ignored at first, even by the council, and as a result, he left. Calvin again returned in September 13, 1541. His only weapon was the Bible. His only weapon was the Bible. He preached the Bible every day, under the power of that preaching, the city began to become transformed. As the people of Geneva acquired knowledge of God's word and were changed by it, the city became, as John Knox called it, a new Jerusalem from which the gospel spread to the rest of Europe, England, and the new world. This change made other changes possible. 
Listen to what Matthew says in chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands. You see, friends, we can't subdue a lost person's heart but God can if we love them, if we preach the gospel to them. And I don't mean hammering it down upon them, I mean sharing the gospel. Showing them what a godly culture looks like by showing love, unity, generosity. All of those things. The Bible teaches us about the things at, that are relevant in the area of theology and issues of life. The Bible teaches us these things. And so Paul exhorts young Timothy to continue on the path of ministry because from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which, we, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Why is the Word of God able to do that? Because as he says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Scripture is the very Word of God. Therefore, it carries with it the authority and the power of God. Moreover, the word of God is indeed sufficient. Therefore, we should believe that Scripture is able to accomplish what God says it will do. Listen to the words of the psalmist in Psalm 19, verses 7 to 9. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. Sandy, I'd, I, I would suspect that you and Ruby Steele get the Officer magazine. Uh, this month or last month our, uh, had an article in it by uh, retired General Shaw Clifton. And he says these words with regards to this whole topic on the Reformation. As we look back across five centuries to those stress-ridden times of ecclesiastical and theological division, we must remember and give thanks. Not only for the fact that today Roman Catholics and Protestants live in much greater harmony and cooperation in many places and on many levels. The word of the God is authoritative. But more importantly, the word of the God is sufficient to what we need. So let us be people of the word. Let us believe that God's word is indeed sufficient to accomplish what God says it will do. The worship team is going to come and lead us into the familiar words of thy word is a lamp, a path unto my feet. But they're going to, to sing another chorus after that so that's a little more reflective and I think one that we truly need to listen to. And that's the words of the chorus. The greatest thing in all the world is knowing you, Jesus. Knowing you knowing he is the word that gives life. He is the sola scriptura. And we would be a people most wise if we began to open this book, study it, meditate upon it, and apply it to our daily walk as he continues to lead us in the path of life.